Okay, so welcome to uh, this first seminar um, called On Sound, On Sound. Um, I've been looking very, very much forward to, um, to, to this uh, lecture series where I will be doing the first seminar uh, of today and the last seminar in, yeah, after eight weeks. Um, the first seminar here is kind of an introduction um, where I'll present the course and uh, what we'll go through. Um, so I'll start out introducing myself. Uh, my name is uh, Jakob Eriksen. I am um, living in Berlin, originally from Denmark. And my background is in uh, musicology, which I studied at the University of Copenhagen. I had um, some studies in philosophy at the York University in Toronto. And then I did an, a master's degree in sound studies at the Berlin University of the Arts. Um, I did my master thesis on the concept of repetition um, as a sonic notion through the through readings of Søren Kierkegaard, um, Friedrich Nietzsche, and Deleuze, um, who are not specifically philosophers of sound, but in their concepts of repetition, which they all uh, have, they have sonic notions. So that was what, what I was working on uh, there. And since I graduated from sound studies, I've been lecturing pretty extensively uh, at the Humboldt University in Berlin, at University of Copenhagen in musicology, and also at the Rhythmical Music Conservatory in, in Copenhagen. Um, also, I've been lecturing a lot at the Berlin University of the Arts, where I'm of the faculty at uh, the Department of Sound Studies and uh, Sonic Arts. Um, at the moment, I am doing my PhD also at uh, Sound Studies and Sonic Arts at Berlin University of the Arts. And my research topic is on what I call the post-human attitude in Sonic Arts. Um, so I'm trying to um, addressing how topics from post-human theory are, are, are being expressed through sound art and experimental music. And um, I'm doing that by analyzing uh, exemplary case studies of artistic practice. Other than that, I'm also doing um, sound art myself. I'm doing sound installations. I do performances. Um, and I mostly use um, the computer program Max MSP in order to do sound manipulation and uh, sound synthesis. Other than that, I am part of a, a research colloquium here in Berlin called Sonic Thinking. And um, that is what, what we're trying to do there is um, to think through or with sound and not so much about sound. And um, that is pretty much what we are also going to do in, uh, in this course. Um, so let me read the course description just so we are on the same side. I'm sure you all read it, but just in order to, to um, have it fresh in mind. So I wrote, sound. The vibrational force that enters your ear, your, enters your ears, encapsulates our bodies, shakes our worlds. Unsound, the vibrational force that exceeds our ears, goes beyond our bodies, inhabit the world. The interdisciplinary research field of sound studies has in the last decades established a flourishing mesh of sound theories and listening practices. In unsound, undead, from Ebonomic, just that's this book. Um, the research group Audent presents essays challenging the prevailing notion of what sound can be and how the world can be thought sonically. 
by addressing sound through its potentials as vibrational continuum um, on the limit and beyond human hearing, unsound and dead, undead disentangles sound from its anthropocentric notions, revealing a world of sound out of sound. Through inquiries in philosophy, cultural theory, and sonic arts, this course asks, what can inaudible sound do? What are the consequences of vibrational theories? How do these perspectives alter the way we understand audible sound? During the seminar sessions, these questions will, will be addressed in collaboration uh, with six theoretical researchers and sound artists who all have engaged with sound beyond sound, each through their theoretical and artistic practices, approach and methodologies. Additionally, the seminar will touch upon and address concepts such as sonic materialism, polit politics of vibration and post-human listening. So now I will briefly introduce the um, guest lecturers, which we will meet throughout um, throughout the next six uh, next six uh, sessions. The first one is uh, Leslie Garcia, who is uh, part of the group Interspecific, and um, that is an artistic research group who are exploring the more than human or other than human world through installations focusing on sound and specific, uh, specifically the, the interspecies uh, communication. Next up we have Steve Goodman um, who is also under the name of Code9. He is a label manager of the, the record label Hyperdub. He's a producer and DJ um, he is author of Sonic Warfare, which is this book, which has been very influential in uh, sound studies and musicology and cultural studies uh, on sound. Um, then he is also editor of Unsound and Dead. Um, and he has been telling me that he will be doing a presentation from his book um, from, from a concept he kind of coined in the book uh, Sonic Warfare, but really didn't develop. So that will be um, on audio virology, kind of a response also to COVID. Um, so I'm really looking uh, forward to that one, like a, a new take on, on Sonic Warfare. Next up, we have uh, Lawrence Abu Hamdan, which many of you might be familiar with. Uh, he's a sound artist um, doing what he calls uh, sonic forensics. And that is kind of a political investigation on how sound is used as a, as a tool in conflict areas and conflict situations. Um, he has been uh, uh, doing exhibitions um, worldwide. Uh, in, in various established uh, art spaces and, and museums. And he also holds a PhD from Goldsmith in London. Then we have uh, Eleni Ikuniadu. Um, she is author of, of the book, uh, The Rhythmic Event, also editor of Unsound Undead and part of the Audent unit uh, together with uh, Steve Goodman. And she is uh, lecturing at the Royal College of Arts in London. Then we have Toby Hayes, also part of the, the audit, uh, audit um, uh, unit, uh, also co-editor of Unsound Undead. So we have all three editors um, on the roster, which is great. Um, then he's a reader in digital media and head of the Research School of Digital Arts uh, at the Manchester Metropolitan University. He's um, across, uh, doing cross-disciplinary research focusing on the ways that frequencies are utilized um, by governments and uh, industry to influence and ma manipulate and torture. Last but not least, we have uh, Christoph Cox, 
who was uh, co-editing a very influential by um, yeah this book on uh, audio culture which um, really like I, I encountered it when when I read uh, or studied musicology and it kind of changed the way I did study, study musicology so I'm really happy that he's uh, on, on, on the lineup as well. He recently released uh, or published uh, his monograph Sonic Flux um, then he is author of numerous art articles on sonic thinking and sonic ontology, which has been very, in, uh, very influential on um, sound studies, uh, scholarship and debates. Um, he's co-author of Realism Materialism Art, and then he's a professor of philosophy at the Hampshire College in the US of A. Um, before we go any further, I would love to hear if you have any questions or comments so far. You can uh, raise the digital hand or just jump in. I also just check the chat. Okay, that's a question from Vincent. Uh, your master thesis sound interesting. Can I read it anywhere? Um, it's first. <laughs> firstly, it's in German, so I don't know if you will read, read German. I can send it to you if you if you want that. And that's about it so far. Any other questions? No. Good. Um, we are quite a lot of participants. Normally, we would do like kind of a round of introduction. Um, I've been considering this because with um, potentially 47 students, now I can see we are 33 in, in, the, in uh, the participant list. Um, I was thinking that we could do something else than everyone presenting, which can be, uh, be a, a, like it would take up all the time for today. So um, instead of that, I have made a spreadsheet, which I post in the chat now. And um, please, uh, everyone go to that one and um, fill out uh, like your research interest, short biography, where you are located. And um, also you could write in your, your interest in, um, in the course. And if you have a website or any social media that you want to uh, share with each, each other, you can also post a link to that one. So while you are doing that, I want to play some music. Um, and that is um, a piece of music that is also found in Unsound Undead by um, Jena Sutela. It's called uh, Nemia City. So let's see, I'll just... Oh, there's a question. Do you think you have a link to your master thesis about repetition? Um, I don't have a link. I, I can send it to you in, a, in an email. So now I hope I share sound. All right, I think most of you have done your introduction. Um, you can, of course, edit it and, and add to it throughout um, the, the seminar today or, or afterwards. My idea is that I'll compile it into a, a 
PDF that they all send to all of you, and then you can can read each other's introductions. Okay. Um, next up, we have to do some organizational stuff. Um, most of you might be familiar with the structure of the new center. Um, that in order to participate in the course, you have to do some coursework, like you have to do a, a term paper in the end. So there are some uh, additional coursework throughout the seminar um, that should also be stated by the organizers. Um, and some of this coursework is uh, presentations and respondences. And we should try to um, try to um, spread out all of your presentations and responses to to the, the six uh, lectures um, from the guest lectures. So for that, I also prepared a spreadsheet, <laughs> which I post in the chat now. And I don't know if we should, if we should just go uh, anarchistic on it and you can type in where you want to be a um, presenter or responder. Um, maybe we, we, we try to do that in the beginning um, and then we see if it kind of works out by itself. Also, if you have any questions to that, feel free to, to ask. I think I have a question or? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, perhaps, um, I wonder if we could have um, uh, some written information about the six um, six uh, meetings we will have, so we can see where we feel mm -hmm. in. I wonder. Yeah. Uh, really yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah, maybe not now, but maybe after. Written information on them. Say it again. I haven't prepared any written information on them. Yeah, I was just wondering after or yeah. Yeah. I can I can try to do that. Yeah, thank you. So the thing is, they they will um, each of the lectures will provide some texts, and you will then do your take on it, either as a present uh, presenter or a responder. And I'm very sure that all of them will be very interesting. So <laughs> let's see, the names are popping in, which is good.
Oh, there are some questions here. Um, yeah, so Luca asks, sorry, what uh, exactly is the difference between presenting and responding? And James uh, kindly answers, presenters talk about the text and then responders comment on the presenter's presentation. But essentially the responder can give their own thoughts about the text as well. And from Enda, um, are we to sign up for one presentation and one response, uh, or one response, or just one of either? As far as I understood, um, you have to uh, assign for one of them. This is my first course at the news center. So if anyone who is more familiar with the structure can correct me on that one, then it would be highly appreciated. And of course, because we are so many, um, we can uh, we can have several uh, presenters and responders. So there's another question from uh, Guillaume. Um, are we having weekly readings and making a presentation on them, or are we presenting something of our own interesting that relates to the seminar? Okay, good question. So for every seminar, um, the guest lecturers will provide some readings. Um, so for for example, for, for next Sunday, next time we'll meet, uh, Leslie Garcia has sent me some texts that um, I'll send to you uh, after the, the seminar today. And you have to present or respond um, on those uh, texts. Thanks. You're welcome. Yeah, so there's a comment as well that it's a, it's for certificate students who need the credit points. Okay. I'll let that work in the background. Um, let's go to um, today's readings. I don't know if you have read the text. Mm -hmm. So um, because there are no presenters or responders today, I think also because it's a, a seminar form, I really hope that we can have a good discussion. Um, so I hope you have uh, prepared maybe some questions, some, some, some doubts, and then we can kind of discuss the text uh, together. I will do uh, an introduction to them. And um, then let's see uh, where, where it takes us, hopefully into a better understanding of it. Um, I chose these three texts in order to provide an introduction also to, to the seminar um, and to, to the topic of uh, sound studies. What is sound studies? Um, oh, that's a question here before we get into that. So, sorry again, can you resend here the Google Doc? Oh. oh it, okay, someone answered that. Good. Okay, so um, I sent you three texts. One from uh, Jonathan Stern called Sonic Imagination, which, which is the introductory uh, chapter from his uh, The Sound Studies Reader. Then I the third chapter of uh, James's um, book, 
the sonic epist episteme. And then finally, the introduct uh, introductory chapter from uh, On Sound Undead. Um, yes, so um, the reason I chose Jonathan Stern's text is to pro provide an overview of what sound studies is. And um, that doesn't mean that his definition is the, the, the best definition or is uh, going into all aspects of sound studies, but it's pretty uh, broad and, and he points out a lot of uh, valid points of what sound studies can be and how we can do it. Um, the other text uh, from the, the Sonic Episteme by Robin James, um, I chose that as kind of an example of how so sound studies can be, be done. And that text is also referring back to uh, the Jonathan Stern text. Um, so we stay in, in, in uh, the kind of vocabulary that he's providing us. And then uh, Robin James is um, doing a critical uh, reading on, on some uh, sound studies concepts. And then uh, last, there's the introduction to Unsound Undead. So that kind of gives an overview of what um, that book project was about. OK. So let's start with the Jonathan Stern text. Um, what, what is he providing us? So he starts out a, a talking about what is a uh, sound studies and um, his first point of departure is uh, it's the study of sound of everyday life and that doesn't mean that it's a, a static field of study it is it, in the opposite it's really providing um, aspects on 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 different points of history his um, First example is with mobile phones that suddenly uh, all were carrying a mobile phone and the, the, the um, everyday sonic environment was very, very much influenced by uh, ringtones, which then again disappeared because no one uses ringtones anymore because we have vibrations in, uh, on our phones. Um, so that is kind of an aspect on sounds that suddenly appear and then disappears again. Um, and he also provides other examples uh, throughout history where sonic aspects and notions um, are, are, are appearing and disappearing and what takes are on them. So sound studies, what is that? He says that sound studies is a name for the interdisciplinary ferment in the human sciences that takes sound as its analytical point of departure or arrival. By analyzing both sound practices and the discourses and institutions that describe them, redescribes what sound does in the human world and what humans do in the sonic world. Okay, so, so that's uh, at least a point of departure for us to understand what sound studies is, like very, very broadly um, and also a bit human centered. Um, further on, he says that, okay, it doesn't just um, to human uh, relationships to, to sound, but also to animal relationships of, uh, of sound or even sonic concepts that we cannot grasp um, through our uh, human perception of sound, which is uh, normally um, like described as the frequency um, spectrum of uh, 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, which is what ideally our ear can perceive. That doesn't then um, account for what our body as like a bodily ear can perceive because we can go uh, below or be, be beyond that, um, which might not be audio, uh, audible through the ear, but it can affect us uh, bodily and physically. Okay, 
Then he goes on and uh, introduce the, the concept of a sound thinking or to think sonically. And I think that is kind of the, the, the concept that is the most important in, in the introduction um, because it provides us with a vocabulary of how to uh, address um, theories and uh, phenomena um, sonically. And he kind of um, using, uh, he's, he's introducing some examples of, of uh, how um, vocabulary, vocabulary is used in a sonic way. Um, there's the W.E.B. Du Bois um, quote where uh, he's using the word, word uh, echoing um, as, a, as a way of, like we, we use the word reflecting, which is, we can say that's a visual way of thinking. So echoing could be one word, uh, resonating, which we will also encounter with uh, Robin James. Um, is, is another way of thinking sonically. Um, and all of this, um, he is kind of, of, of building up to uh, what he calls the auditory litany. And I'll just find that one. It's on page nine, if you have uh, the text in front of you. So what is this, uh, uh, the audio-visual listening, as he called it. So, so what is that? Um, a lot of sound studies scholarship um, starts out claiming that the world until now has been conceived visually. But there's so much that we neglect through this uh, visual uh, uh, perspective um, that we can find in sound. Some of them kind of uh, say that actually we should conceive the sound, uh, conceive the world through sound as a more um, or a better way of, of conceiving it and understanding it. Um, and they kind of create this um, um, dualism between the visual uh, on the one side and, and, and the sonic on the other side. And on page nine, he is then uh, listing uh, uh, some examples of, of how hearing or sound um, is contradictory uh, or oppositional to uh, the visual. So I'll just read them out. Um, hearing is spherical. Vision is directional. Hearing immerses its subject. Vision offers a perspective. Uh, sounds come to us, but vision travels to its object. Hearing, uh, con hearing is concerned with interiors. Vision is concerned with surfaces. Hearing involves physical contact with the outside world. Vision requires distance from it. Hearing places you inside an event. Seeing gives uh, you a perspective on that event. Hearing tends toward subjectivity. Vision tends toward objectivity. Hearing brings us into the living world. Sight moves us toward atrophy, atrophy and death. Um, hearing is about affect. Vision is about intellect. Hearing is primarily um, temporal sense. Vision is primarily spatial sense. Hearing is a sense that immerses us in the world while vision removes us from it. Okay. So what happens here is, of course, um, an ideal uh, way of understanding uh, the world kind of beyond hearing, but using hearing or, or auditory metaphors uh, in order to give, get a new perspective of how to encounter the world. And what is suggested by this approach is that sound can, with sound, we can situate ourselves and understand the world from within, um, which is opposite of the positivistic way of, of um, distancing yourself from the world and look at it from afar with, uh, from afar with this um, 
God eye perspective, um, which has been very much criticized through philosophy um, or late philosophy uh, because it has again and again and again been yeah, argumented that um, we can always think different. So instead of saying, now I have the new uh, truth about the world, then saying, okay, I situate myself here in the middle of it, and then take from it what, what, what comes to me, what, what, is a, what, what I am perceiving it as. And by that, making your position clear that it is a position. Okay. So, at the same time, um, he's also uh, criti criticizing this because, of course, it's a dualism that needs to be criticized and it has to be combined. Or maybe we have to go beyond that um, as well. Um, but it's very good to have in mind that that is an argumentation that is used throughout sound studies in order to maybe to, to um, uh, on studies to, to uh, be some kind of importance. Of course, sound studies is important, but it's not uh, in, in any hierarchy above uh, or philosophy or, or whatever. It has to connect. Okay, so this connection is also um, very important because as he argues that sound studies is a hybrid field in itself, um, as it is with the uh, other studies, um, where you have uh, cultural studies or animal studies or gender studies, or there, there are a lot of uh, fields of studies. Um, it's different than the kind of classical uh, disciplines of, let's say, philosophy, anthropology, um, sociology, uh, musicology, uh, and, and so on. So what does this studies mean? That means that it is inherent to, uh, interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary, um, taking an aspect which we can find in all these other disciplines and uh, focusing on sound uh, in, 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 in this instance, or gender or uh, visuals or um, whatever the studies uh, represent. So in that way, we can do sound studies, uh, which is anthropology, we can do sound studies that is philosophy, we can do sound studies that is musicology, and so on. Um, so what can this approach do that is kind of um, meant to be a breeding ground for connecting all these studies and doing something not just like a, between them but doing something new like trying to go beyond them and I think um, that is a tendency that we very much uh, experience um, these years that we have um, uh, new humanities, uh, for example, we have uh, digital humanities, we have medical humanities, um, like we have a lot of these post-disciplinary um, fields of, of study, which um, doesn't necessarily uh, ascribe to, to the traditions of what we um, have encountered in, in uh, Western academia. Um, so far. Yes, so. So far, do you have any questions or, or, or comments to that? Nope. Oh, there's one there. Let's see. Thanks a million. Okay, that's that's a good question. Okay. 
Okay, so um, let's go to the next text, the one of uh, Robin James. Let me just find I put my note on that one. Yes. Okay, so um, why did I include the, the, the text or the chapter three from the Sonic Episteme, Episteme from Robin James with, with the title uh, Vibration and Diffraction, Acoustic Resonance as a Materialist Ontology? Well, um, I think this is um, an example of critical sonic thinking in sound studies. Uh, so she is working on a concept of philosophy like outside of the, the, the fringe of sound studies um, and then introducing them into sound studies. So um, I'm, I'm focusing mostly on, on, the, on the first part of, of the chapter. It's quite dense, it's quite long. Um, so what I wanted to, to get from it, there's, there's this critical reading of, um, of vibrational ontology. So, um, she's taking uh, three scholars, uh, three um, uh, philosophers, um, as an example of, of how to think uh, sonically. Um, the, the first one is Elizabeth Gross, uh, Gross uh, the other one is Jane Bennett, and the third one is Karen Barad. And she kind of treat them both individually, but mostly as like one having the same um, um, perspective on, on uh, vibration as, as a physical uh, uh, understand, a physical understanding of the world. So on page uh, 90, uh, she's saying that vibration is the elementary structure of matter as a factual claim about reality. That is kind of her condensed understanding of those three scholars' uh, work. And that is to say that um, understanding physical matter as something that is vibrating. Um, we can go down on a molecular, a molecular level and, and see that, okay, every all uh, molecules are vibrating. And in that sense, the whole world is vib vibrating. And um, then we can like have a vibrating understanding of the world, a vibrating ontology. So her critique of that is that instead of providing a, a new perspective that allows for situatedness, like reading uh, Haraway, we can, we can understand the world uh, through, uh, like it, it has to be understand situated in, instead of all encompassing, because this would just be a new uh, objectivity. Um, and Robin James is criticizing this new objectivity or new physical way of thinking um, of being just a, a, a new kind of Western thought that is trying to objectively describing how everything is uh, on all levels. And that is her problem with that, uh, which is uh, known as a new uh, materialism. Um, but before going really into that critique, um, she's also providing um, more vocabulary for uh, thinking with sound. So uh, thinking with resonance, thinking with consonance, dissonance and harmony. So this is what she also calls the, the, the resonant, resonant methodology. Um, and that is where, where she says that um, moving from a juridical rationality to a calculative 
a rationality. That is kind of a neoliberalist ideology. So everything can be calculated through its uh, vibrations, through, through its uh, uh, resonances, consonances, dissonances, and harmony. So an idealistic way of understanding the world. Um, she provides some alternatives uh, after that in the end, but I think, I think we have some, um, I think we have some ground here for, for opening up for discussions. So I hope you have uh, a lot of questions that we can like kind of engage with uh, uh, now. There's one comment saying peak Western animism. Well, uh, maybe uh, Martina, you want to elaborate on that? Hey, hi. Um, hi, everyone. Hi. Yeah, it was a bit of a fleeting comment on the text. Um, referred, obviously, not to Robin James, but um, to a critique mm -hmm. of new materialism, which um, I go gave that definition to, which is maybe a bit unfair. Um, but it's kind of how I see the way that they try and interpolate and kind of use sound and vibration to their own advantage in a way that seems a bit superficial and ill thought. And I think um, the part of the essay when she was speaking about the audiovisual litany was particularly stringent um, in exposing how that's kind of like a fallacy of this binary between the ocular and the auditory and like this ideal form um, of understanding this auditory, which, yeah, seems a bit superficial and misses out on, on a lot of more uh, of a more complex understanding and unpacking of sound by the otherwise and a lot of other people, you know, hence the critique of non-inclusivity into the history of feminism, non-inclusivity into the discourse of post-colonialism. So, um, yeah, I really like the text. Um, kind of keen to know what everyone else um, thought. I thought um, the bit about um, talking about the exercise that she was doing about um, Christina Sharp's The Wake was also really interesting. Um, and the exploration of sound um, across black radical thought um, kind of made me think of um, maybe uh, Fred Moten's recollections of the um, Aunt Hester's scream. I don't know if people are familiar. Um, maybe you can. With uh, yeah, so there is, um, God, the title escapes me. I'll link it up to everyone. But um, Frederick Jameson, uh, Frederick Douglass, um, kind of description of his life and his family life uh, through slavery includes a lot of um, instances of exploration through sound and there is this particular moment yes thank you Sebastian it's in the break um, where Moton uses this uh, piece of Douglas which is the recounting of um, Aunt Tessa's scream as she gets beaten and so the how the sound would travel um, as an expression of um, pain, resistance, lack of words, lack of different, um, maybe different um, visual register um, to break out of that situation. Anyways, it's, it's really interesting. And I think there is a part of Robin James' reflection that made me think of that and that I think uh, people may be interested in reading a bit more about. But yeah, uh, keen to know what everyone else made of uh, James' text because I thought it was really interesting and also quite dense and a lot to unpack. And I, yeah. 
Okay, maybe Sebastian, you want to uh, further it? Oh, no, I just, um, yeah, that was a great uh, reference, I thought, uh, in regards to Fred Moten, but I was, I was also quite fascinated by uh, James' text. And I, uh, there was another text by her that I once read that talked about this phenomenon of, of the drop in EDM music and how this, how this is somehow symptomatic of our burnout culture. I thought that her comparison was perhaps a bit too hyperbolic and exaggerated. And it was quite an outrageous comparison, but maybe that, that's what made it even more entertaining perhaps. Um, but I, uh, what was not super clear to me in the text was how exactly does, does James see this um, transition from, let's say the sovereign regime to the, to the neoliberal regime of uh, you know, risk, uh, risk management and pure uh, calculation and statistical values. How does she, she see this transition um, in the new materialist ontology that she's speaking about, how because because what I what I got from the text, I also have to say that I didn't finish it, so maybe this is revealed in the end. But she's somehow implying that um, you know this, this this ideology is somehow pertinent to to new materialist ontologies in a way that is somehow concealed or not clearly <laughs> visible, and then she somehow connects it connects it to. Um, uh, to sound, but this was yeah not super clear to me. But I also yeah I'm sorry I didn't I didn't finish it, finish the text. So maybe yeah. sure we can discuss this. Did anyone get the connection between this vibrational ontology and the neoliberalism, which she she argues that is inherent in it? Um, I think maybe I was kind of. Perhaps did. Um, I've, I was kind of thinking in, in the sense of like how representation within neoliberalism just tries to quantify things um, and like force them into a numerical system of, 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 of ontologies. Um, whilst, um, yeah, there's like if something's oscillating, then it defies that. So there's, there's that tension there between things which can't necessarily um, which defy that sort of mode of, of measurement. Um, um, so yeah, like when, and, and to me, like I'm thinking in academia in terms of like when uh, universities sort of impose these like research, um, like coefficients onto like the value of research and all these things like that are inherently like not quantifiable. It's like, that's like the, the, the sort of, um, yeah, the neoliberal uh, quantification impulse at its worst, yeah. Yeah, sure, I think uh, that was also what I got from it, like this um, like uh, idea of that you can kind of calculate uh, and rely upon con um, um, like this new kind of chance calculation that the world is open, but according to this set of of, of uh, numeral ideologies. I had also a brief question about this text. I was interested in the selection of references too that she uses to exemplify this argument, and I it made me wonder whether these three um, theorists and then the also pop cultural reference she uses are really sonic in the same way that she characterizes new, materiali new materialisms as being because they seem almost to be a sort of sonic form of witnessing maybe, or they're more concerned. They almost turn a sort of, I mean, using this uh, audio, you know, the audio visual um, uh, litany, they seem to sort of make into sound forms of, of representing whether that's a kind of witness of historical grief or it's like a, a persistence of something that almost has an archival basis. And I, I was kind of curious about those choices because it seems like there are other there are other sources, even if you want to confine yourself to like a black so black studies source that deal with orality as a way of pushing uh, past forms of enclosure. I mean, of course, deconstruction is an example and that 
I think that idea of orality there also has a sort of um, draws in some way from African tradition. So I, I wouldn't say it's it's necessarily reason to you know uh, reject the the critique, which I also found extremely compelling. But um, it made me sort of pause at at the way um, James was making that argument. Mm -hmm. So you mean the the how she chose the the um, what they call uh, Gross, uh, Bennett, and Barad. I'm sorry, I, I meant rather um, the selection, in fact, of the um, the Christina Sharp text and the three examples that she relies on later. Well, of course, I cannot answer for her, um, but but uh, surely there's a, a perspective there um, that might be missing. So do, does her argument, uh, does it hold water? Does like, can you compare these uh, vibrational ontologies to the uh, those uh, uh, black ontologies that she is or black vibrational uh, uh, modes of thinking uh, and being that she is uh, providing us with. So if that's not the way to go, how, how do we open it up then? Um, why, why is it that the vibrational ontologies are what you call politics of exception? When they try to provide a, a, something new that is kind of, kind of encapsulating more and understanding the world um, better or different than um, how we has uh, we have done it before. How 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 does that that then make this politics of exception? Vincent, you have a, a comment there. Maybe you want to say it out loud. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, basically, I think the, the problem with the book is that like she makes like a really, really big claim because if resonance and stochasticism are inherently problematic, then you basically need to rewrite all of, of modern physics and all of modern life, basically. So she has to make like this really, really big claim about resonance and stochasticism in general um, to make a very small claim about sound studies. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's like a that's very bad kind of structure of argumentation. And also I think she makes like some really kind of crazy logical leaps like the leap from resonance to, to, to uh, like statistics to, oh, this is automatically oppressive because biopolitics also uses statistics. Like, if statistics are inherently bad, then, like, so many things are bad. That's what I mean. That, like, 
she has to rely on making like these really, really big claims to make like a very specific claim about some studies. Yeah, and that's, that's also kind of why I, I included the text that it is a big claim that she's making. Um, and can, can we follow it through when it's such a big claim in order to prove something in sound studies? Or is it actually just sound studies that is kind of also proving that there's something inherently wrong with how we do uh, academic work and scholarship? I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to like, um, unfortunately I didn't, uh, only got halfway through the text as well because I've been moving um, at my studio. But sure. uh, I'm kind of curious as to whether she is making the claim, um, you know, uh, of disregarding uh, vibration or whatever, uh, or if she's just kind of like making a claim against new materialist ontologies, right? Because I understood it to be more like, she's making a claim about like uh, a counterclaim to a strong claim being posed by the three theorists that she draws up, which is that like, this is the new sort of like ontology and therefore like, uh, you know, any kind of representational one is, is, is more abundant, like not worth pursuing. Um, I mean, does this imply the, the claim therefore that like we completely disregard, um, you know, uh, uh, like vibration as a kind of uh, as a kind of avenue. I'm I'm not sure if it goes that far, but like I say, I didn't actually finish the text, so I um, unfortunately I can't really like say what what what's being said in the text in that sure. regard. But yeah, main parts of the critique is in the in the first part of the text. Yeah, what I got from the text was not exactly this, and I'm not. I'm, uh, I'm somewhat of a beginner in this field, I think. Yeah. But uh, I don't think she, she says in, in any moment that the this vibrational model of ontology is inherently wrong or inherently. For example, in, in the in some of the end notes, she cites Steve Goodman's model of ontology, but uh, she says he doesn't uh, he doesn't say it's a it's a better way or the only way or it's somewhat. I don't I don't remember exactly how she puts it. But she basically says it, he doesn't make us the same claim of superseding this other knowledge. Because I, I don't think at any moment she, she's saying, okay, we have to disregard modern science or anything. But she's more, she's more critiquing how this, this model of thinking basic, based on modern science is, is also making a huge claim that we have to disregard philosophy or disregard any model of correlational thinking or anything. And I'm again not specialist in these studies, but yeah, it just seems to be more of a, it's not that this ontology is necessarily wrong, but I don't know, maybe our, our access to this ontology can't be pure or clean in the way that, okay, we can disregard our position in this world or the position of this theory in the world. Mm -hmm. So I think that is what I say to, to Vincent's comment about it. it's not necessarily I didn't read it that way at least. Mm -hmm. So one thing she is not explicitly stating um, but I kind of read in through like between the lines is this kind of new materialism and vibrational ontology is trying to do a, a flat a hierarchy of, of thinking and by that dismissing like a power structures that are here. Um, that was what I kind of, uh, like she could have been more ex explicit about that if that's what she is also meaning. I'm not sure about that. But that was one thought I had while reading the text as well. I kind of see there's like some commonality perhaps between like this concept of sound relating to unsound and like philosophy as relating to like other types of thought which are like arbitrarily not deemed philosophy which like seems to be like the object of this like text and kind of like in in the sense that like like categorically there's no difference between like sound and unsound it's just like a spectral kind of like like 
according to like the, the, the listener, like what they are like uh, sensitive to pick up on that, like defines the category of sound as opposed to unsound. While like, like, so someone else is like gatekeeping, like the boundary of what philosophy with capital P is in relation to other types of thought, which actually like, like do have as much value and like importance. So like, yeah, did you sort of see that when in that, in that relation between the text and, and this like, in a more broad sense, like. If, if I did that? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. It was, it was uh, that to me feels like, uh, I don't know, maybe maybe it was my, my reading of it rather than. Yeah, no, it's it's a good question. Also addressed in, uh, in Jonathan Stern's uh, text, this kind of understanding sound as vibration. Um, so, is anything that vibrates, is that then sonic inherently? Or is it defined through a listening a, or a perception of, 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 of hearing? Um, if it's a squirrel or a human being or a whale, um, is it sound when it can be heard by someone who can per perceive vibrations uh, as, as sound? <laughs> um, or is a, a, Planets uh, 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 vibrating is that also sound like uh, provided by by NASA, uh, for example? Like often you you see a post by NASA saying that uh, this is the sound of planet uh, Jupiter um, or the like, and then it's uh, transposed into uh, human hearing range. So that 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 way of understanding uh, sound. Um, it's, it's, I think it's difficult to say that it's not sound, but it's also difficult to say that it's sound. Um, is it the perceiver or is it the thing uh, making the sound that is important in, in that, or is it the relationship between them? Um, it's a valid, valid question and, and it opens up for, for a lot of thinking. And, and that I think that's also what kind of uh, was was uh, one of the grounds of of a uh, unsound uh, uh, undead, the book. Um, but what what is actually happening there? How can we challenge our uh, understanding of of sound? And what does that what does that then do? Is is part of the the concept of audiovisual litany also that? Um, sound is considered as somehow excluded from any kind of like um you know social it doesn't have any kind of like a social component to it because it's some sort of a prim primordial pri primordial force that that exists uh almost like some sort of vit someone mentioned vitalism before almost some sort of like a vitalist force that exists outside of any kind of like yeah social baggage or let's say um yeah, social hierarchies. It's almost like some sort of an esoteric kind mm -hmm. of a kind of element. That's how I also read it. Yeah, well, it's funny when 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 we le when we read uh, the list that uh, Jonathan Stern is providing us, then um, sound is mentioned, but mostly it's hearing versus uh, vision. So that kind of implies that it's the perceiver that is a like that is introduced in in, in the audiovisual uh, litany and 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 not some so much what often is called sound in itself so there's a division between the perceiver of of uh, auditory vibrations uh, or sounds and then the sound in itself in 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 this way of thinking and of course sound in itself is also an I, I, ideal concept of uh, how to understand what sound is. So, um, like an, a, a usual model you have to uh, you have when you explain what sound is, that is, you have a, a, in the one end a medium that is vibrating, and then it goes through air into the ear. Uh, so that is the the hearer or the, the, the listener or perceiver. And um, so you have that uh, dualism between a, a vibrating object that is producing some sound, which then travels through the air into the ear. And that connection is what sound is. Um,
Vincent, you are allowed to talk as well. well I was just saying that uh, François Jabonnet, who is at, uh, I think, IRCAM or GM, GRM in Paris, and he also does a similar trick where he says uh, there is no sound in itself. Mm -hmm. uh, sound always comes kind of overdetermined uh, with, with social meaning. And if we had just sound to itself, we couldn't even understand it because this, um, this kind of extra surplus meaning is inherent to what sound is because we can only perceive it. Sure, so, so that is also what uh, um, Jonathan Stern is arguing, that we are always positioned as listeners. So I am, I am listening to, to a sound and you are listening to a sound and it might be what we can say is the same sound, but we perceive it differently, though it's the same sound. Is I think, uh, like, I, I just want to say something about uh, this posi positionality of listening. Mm -hmm. That, like, um, I've been reading the last weeks this um, book called uh, Hungry Listening by mm -hmm. Dylan Robinson. And it's really interesting that he's like talking about this uh, pos position of listening, not only in a physical way, but also he's using like these uh, two words uh, called like halkeme uh, ilem, because it's like uh, from like indigenous sound studies. So it's like uh, how you position as the conqueror and then how you position in, uh, in these marginal positions, you know? Uh, as an indigenous or as a black, as a, a women or all these minorities that have problems in a political or social environment. So, I mean, I'm really interested, uh, interested in how it's not only all this like a uh, physical um, realm of listening, but also this position of like that um, has to do with like a social class uh, and uh, where are you like a position in a, in a political way, not like only uh, my physical capacity of listening, but also uh, what is inherent to my race and uh, where I was born and uh, how I was like a uh, form as a human or as a social being. Yeah, sure. And maybe that's also the point of, of, of uh, um, James that she is trying to, to claim. The sound cannot just be vibration, it, it also has to be that kind of position. Right. Yeah, what I liked about the second part of the text, the James text, in relation to that, in relation to the unsound text, is that to me she seems to, to put unsound not exactly as this, this completely unknown thing or completely outside and alien, but exactly that people live in these in this regions of sound that the, the, the colonial culture, let's say, calls not sound or that is, this isn't sound or this isn't hearing or this isn't, and this is actually not this other thing, but it's a very lived experience of actual people, but we tend to disregard it as outside of the of what sound is and what sound yeah this ontology of sound yeah and this this is actually some uh in regards to the to vincent's comment of of this last comment uh this is something i'm i'm currently interested in, in research and i'm again i'm new so it's, i would be very interested to know about what you think about it at uh, the sort of sound in themselves and that brings me like to, to music basic, right? Uh, John Cage's uh, thinking and everything. And it's very, it's, it's uh, caught my attention in the, 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 the reference she makes, the, the three authors, uh, James Sykes, that is, it's very musical uh, thinking, right? It's like co uh, resonance, consonance, dissonance, harmony, chords, and, and, harmonics and I was thinking exactly about that how at least from uh, from what I'm studying currently there is this sort of musical thinking that is very abstract very sounds in themselves and there's only these vibrations and relations about that but 
some studies maybe or these other theories of sound or post cajun sound art practice, I don't know, are interested in the opposite of that. That is this meaning of sound, of sound, significant sound, of relational listening and everything. And I don't know, I would be very interested to know what everyone thinks about it in, in, in relation to this text, because it's something that caught my attention these readings. Yeah, so there's a lot of things in, 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 in your comment there, like, for example... Yeah, uh, sorry. <laughs> that's good, that's good. Um, also, a thing that, that I was thinking about while, while you were speaking and, and while I was reading the, the, the James text was this, uh, that, that vibrational thought or vibrational ontology is nothing new like we just have to just we we have we, we can go uh, all the, all the way uh, back to i think it was a uh, pythagoras who was a uh, talking about the harmony of the spheres like a sonic understanding of the universe like everything is harmonious in that way because it is vibrating it is a uh, musical in 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 that way um and it's maybe just a new take on 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 that which has been yeah, presented through Pythagoras and Kepler and uh, Kirchner and there, there, there are many uh, musical thinkings or understandings of of the universe in itself and that it has to be uh, a, a harmonious or it is harmonious in itself also when it's uh, resonant um, that is where it flows and apps into itself and each other. Um, so that was the first thing I was thinking about. The next thing I forgot because I was talking. <laughs> Maybe it pops out in a minute. Other comments on that? Hi, it's me. Uh... As we have said, sound is a kind of uh, and sonic uh, research is a position that we take. Uh, and uh, of course, it's a highly philosophical uh, question in my point of view. And as the text said, um, in the ways we perceive the world. So uh, I was thinking uh, that maybe that model of thought related to the vibrations and all these uh, sonic terms and uh, all, all this terminology maybe mostly describes this highly difficult uh, world of effects that we live in. So maybe along with this ontology that uh, the texts are trying to describe, maybe this contribution might be seen as a comment on our current temporality. We've said about neoliberalism, we've said about biopolitics, maybe there is also a parallel line of uh, making an, an ontology of our current state in terms of uh, this mess of political action, this entangled reality of uh, many different epistemologies where the sonic can offer a lot of uh, metaphors maybe so may maybe this this is a good w not a, a very effective way of describing what's going on maybe because matter is under question uh, effects are under question and maybe after the postmodern condition there's something else that yet we have no no terms to describe it exactly some thinkers try to describe it many epistemologies are trying to do transdisciplinary uh, approaches. Uh, so yes, maybe I, I, after all of these contributions and uh, the very nice comments I've heard, I'm thinking of that, that maybe all these discussions are in a long way of producing uh, comments on this current temporality, which I don't know how we can describe it. Maybe Mark Fisher tried to describe it like a dispersed corporation of uh, of uh, a new kind of uh, uh, capitalism realism, but there, there might be a lot of contributions onto that. Uh, maybe still we don't know <laughs> what will be this temporal, the name of this temporality, but I'm, I'm thinking of that like, and after all these comments, like, uh, like we are moving towards that, toward describing also uh, 
let's say, a historical stage, a new historical stage through this ontology, something like that. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very good point. Also, I think that's the point of, of uh, Robin James' book, like the sonic ep episteme, that is like how we understand the world through sound. Um, and she is describing how sound scholars or sound students are, are describing this world through sound as a new way of thinking. Um, and on the same time, she is critiquing it and coming with alternatives to it. It's a very good point. Yeah, Catherine. Um, I had one other thought um, after the comments on um, the idea that these sort of marginal sonic practices or theories are positional. And I kind of want to maybe question that a little more because I, I'm thinking of more ontological character characterization, say, of blackness as a form of social death, which is a more maybe Afro-pessimist account. And it makes me wonder why or whether we should restrict this critique of new materialisms in terms of their extraction of signal from noise rather than their maybe their failure to understand silence or gaps in the sonic episteme. Because I mean, and it seems like both of these critiques could be valid and the, the, the positionality of sound, especially for marginal groups is very valid, but there's sort of another, maybe more ontological like substructure of this that kind of gets re-provincialized by this approach where the people who are doing work that picks up on historical traces in a sonic way can are this exception but in fact the, the sort of maybe more foundational critique of blackness as a category in its sonic form still evades this critique that James is offering. Mm -hmm. Any, any um, takes on that? How can we further it? How can we develop this maybe in a third way? I don't know, I just think, um, it's, I think that's also like a, like a more fundamental thing in the sense that like, for example, uh, James is like, obviously like an anti-realist like she doesn't, I mean, she's a Foucauldian, so she doesn't, she's like a hardcore Foucauldian, so she doesn't really think it makes any sense to talk uh, about the world in itself, whereas some of these other like vibrational ontologists or whatever you want to call them are like, okay, we have to describe the world how it really is, even without any humans. Mm -hmm. There's a Christoph Cox paper where he ran through, uh, where he responds to two people who really attacked him, like, oh, you are doing all these bad things. Mm -hmm. I can maybe look in the chat if I find it. But yeah, I think there's also maybe like a more fundamental philosophical difference between this position in the sense that some people think that we can talk about the world in itself and then describe it in terms of sound that our people think that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, Yeah, sure. Good comment. Um, she is also, by using the word uh, episteme, she is in a, a Foucauldian uh, tradition of thinking, which means that we are always in the world as thinkers and not, uh, we cannot, okay, so, so truth is what we make it and truth will uh, change. So they, um, what we thought was true in the 16th century, which is often what, where, where Foucault goes back to, um, was at that point uh, true about the world and then it changed through Renaissance and, and, and up to uh, modernity or modernism. Um, and now we are maybe uh, after uh, modernism, we are uh, post-modern or, or even post-post-modern. And that might provide a, a, another way of thinking, I think. And that is also what, what, what she's trying to do, right? saying, saying that, okay, uh, uh, new materialism is, is um, just a new way of, of doing the episteme. Um, and in that way, she's um, criticizing the way of the, 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 the arguing, arguing for a kind of objectivity. Um, and, and by that, um, excluding um, 
or the power relations, power uh, structures that we we have learned from uh, Foucault. So definitely, definitely, it's it's two schools of thoughts that are colliding there. Yeah. So Vincent just posted um, an article by Christoph Cox, who uh, we can maybe talk to him about in 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 the last uh, of the guest lectures. Um, I also included the, uh, this text from Robin James because it's criticizing a lot of of this idealism, which is uh, inherent in, in, for example, uh, uh, Cox's uh, theory. And I think it's also all right to criticize um, the way James is um, narrowing it down to an idealism because when you read Bennett and 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 Barad, I haven't been too much into to cross I, I must admit but they have they're very uh, reflected upon their this positioning of themselves um, especially current Barad being uh, being not fond of only having a physical world but having this bridge between or or com combining uh, what has been divided uh, in, in nature and culture, that it, it does it does connect. Um, so it would have been a bit beautiful, I would say, in in, in uh, James' take on 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 especially Barad, uh, that she is trying to get rid of this dualism between nature and culture, and that nature and culture is one and uh, and the same. It works together all the time as one and the same. Um, I don't know if anyone else. Uh, so Enda, you think that James has tried to burn? Yeah, I think, I think earlier on she basically says, um, I mean, at least that, that she doesn't really dispute this kind of um, intra-agency that's posed by Barad, but I think more um, well, I think, I think, again, having not read the whole text, and I'm very hesitant to, like, say too much for that reason, but, um, you know, uh, you can posit this kind of, like, intra-agency, but then not really speaking about that in, in, in um, like, what that, what that intra kind of constitutes, in a sense, um, maybe elides a lot, or, I don't know, I mean, my, my real sort of, like, underlying thing here is, 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 I, I feel like she's not really like trying to have a go at new materialism in the sense of like saying that uh, like no no it's it's totally an incorrect view it's, it's more like I think she's like negating the the like the posturing of new uh, of new materialism in a sense uh, which which is a kind of implicit claim that truth can be gleaned from this kind of like immediacy of being and I think it goes back to the kind of um, the other text that the previous one which sets up these kind of like dichotomous relationships between like the visual and the auditory um, in which like there's a kind of underlying assumption in favor of, of sound uh, that the kind of, you know, the circumambient or the kind of immer the, the immersive model uh, and the kind of closeness uh, has, you know, there's a kind of, there's a kind of, uh, I don't know, maybe like a, a kind of an ass assertion that this, this is kind of like um, this being with uh, has absolute advantage, whereas actually I, I think it's worth asking like whether distance has lots and lots of useful virtues uh, and not only whether that distance has virtues, but also what kind of a context in which I think somebody was saying it earlier, you know, in what context is that distance to be communicated? I think this is alighted in, in many ways, right? Like, yes, I mean, you have like uh, the the history of, of enlightenment, rationalism and all of the kind of baggage that comes with this. But this isn't, you know, this is making like a, a, a kind of formal claim from a kind of historical um, like contingency in a sense. And can we uh, like, like step back from this in some sense and think of some other way to kind of negotiate between competing representations rather than to simply say that, uh, you know, this kind of non-representational or vibrational mode of understanding uh, has primacy? Because I think this is like how it lends itself to the neoliberalism of like not not positing some third some other 
outside of the immediacy of the given, in which case you can't really start to like develop new political projects or something like this. You have just like constant uh, open input model of, of, of sound, which, you know, then it kind of like falls back on like subjective determinations rather than having a kind of um, like a positive project to kind of uh, use as a critique of, of the sort of like, yeah, uh, all the stuff that, that um, yeah, again, I forgot who said it, but it was a really great point about how, you know, uh, this kind of circumambience of sound maybe is a good analog for discussing how, uh, you know, um, the conditions, the, the kind of phenomenal conditions of complexity uh, are, are lived in, in the sort of contemporary moment. So yeah, I think, I don't know, um, I, I felt like that was kind of what she was doing in the first part that I read, which was, um, yeah, suggesting that this kind of immediate, like sweeping aside of, of that representational third is, is uh, you know, limited strategy. Um, yeah, that was, that's, Yeah, Vincent, you just posted a, a response kind of to that. Vincent? <laughs> ah, okay. Oh, there you go. And can you hear me? Yes. Okay. No, I was saying that um, Alexander Galloway, who um, also does kind of very strong critique of this kind of new materialism, which is interesting because he comes from a kind of Deleuzian background. But I think like uh, Deleuze and Guattari in like the 80s text, like Thousand Battles, I think they also, re they already also see this, they already see this problem that like if you just have like a really fat ontology, there's nothing really good or bad, like you have to pick and choose. Mm. So I think if, if you read like this kind of, like I don't think you necessarily need a new perspective. I think if you would like develop this kind of vibrational thing correctly, then you can already in, incorporate that critique in, in the theory, which I think Ross does, but I haven't, I haven't, I haven't read it so closely. What was the last sentence you said that uh, kind of dropped out? No, I was just saying that I think Gross, uh, Elizabeth Gross also does this, but I haven't read the book so closely, so I say. Thanks. I have like a comment that um, kind of relates to what Ender was saying. Um, just like kind of thinking perhaps um, of this like synesthesia involved with like a post-human understanding of um of sound and um perhaps that this maybe in the in in the paper where I was discussing um I forget which of them it was but the one that was discussing about how sound can be extrapolated from from image um using um yeah um so um like it, once we have like you know the sufficient like computing power to to sort of do this then like at what point do are, are the sort of sensory like the anthropocentric senses like differentiated from each other if we can if if the information like can be readily converted between them then then it's almost like there's no a priori distinction between like sound and vision anymore um so is there like is there like a post-human understanding where like like everything sensible eventually converges? Yeah, good question. That was in the beginning of, of uh, James' text. Um, so she was mentioning this, say, uh, audiovisual camera that can, or vibrational camera that could, through the, the camera lens, uh, uh, recreate sound as objects are vibrating. Um, I'm not sure if that's uh, like if that's merging our uh, senses per se, but it's underlining the fact that sound, that, that that the objects also vibrate, and that the vibration can be filmed, like visually. But then again, this film is 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 a um, 
transformed into sound in order for us to hear it. So it's not that we can see the, vis uh, the, the, the video and, 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 and then perceive it as sound. So of course, it's just a technology. Um, and then the question is, is post uh, are we post-human just because of te technology? I'm, I'm not really sure if, if, um, if that's the case, because then we have been post-human always. Um, <laughs> like, since we discovered how to make fire, which is also a, a, a position some have. You had another uh, uh, comment, James? Oh, I just no, I just thought something out where, where just kind of in that same vein, like um, there's this like method of spying where if there's like a conversation happening in a room behind like closed doors, but that like um, spy agencies or whoever can can like shine a laser onto like a sort of um, movable surface, like a cup of water or something, and then like based on the light sort of ref re reflection of that off the laser, they can they can you know recreate the sound. Yeah. I think it's more or less the same technique because of the different uh, different uh, disturbances in the, in the wavelengths. But surely it's giving a, a new perspective on, on, on technology. What, what can be uh, considered as a, as, a, as a listening device? It doesn't have to be a microphone that is in the air. It could be a laser pointing, it could be um, a camera. Yeah, and I think the whole digital technology, can, I think it's, it's always the, also this technological synesthesia, right? Like it's, it's only data, so we can change from visual data to audio data at any moment. And I think there's a lot of work that, uh, artwork that explores this sort of transition and dialogue in this new, new possibilities of technology. Yeah, very much. Yeah, and that's also what we are going to talk about next uh, uh, time um, with uh, Leslie Garcia and, and this kind of interspecies communication. Because what, what she's doing a lot is, is uh, like saying, taking non-human materials or, or, or beings um, like our bacteria or, or, or fungi and, and, and translating that into a sound and is that then communication or is that just like making something auditory? Um, I'm very sure that we'll, we'll, we'll talk a lot about that, but she's like creating this kind of technological um, uh, setup. So Enda is saying, great, I'm gonna do a presentation on the octopus tweet. Sorry, I'm just chatting shit on the chat. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, now there are new messages here. Love the James text. Peak with, uh, oh, that's James, what the fuck? No chilling. <laughs> ah, <laughs> now I understand as well. Sorry. No, all good. Let's keep this conversation <laughs> going. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe we should uh, try to incorporate the, the introductory chapter to uh, Unsound Undead. It's a very short text. Did you uh, all read it? Um, yeah, it's just a few pages. Um, 
Oh, let's see here. Thanks. So, what 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 are we um, what are we about to experience with this book when we read it? What what are they saying? And what 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 kind of thinking are we getting introduced to? Um, it's it's in its style. It's very different than uh, uh, James and and Stern. Um, so maybe um, I'm sure some of you would have some 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 good point of view of of, of this. Um, but what 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 kind of text is this we're engaging with, and what is it trying to do? Because it's also pretty dense. Anyone? Okay, so like one of the core sentences I have underlined is um, this is unsound as a speculative probe. What, what is meant here? As unsound as a speculative probe. Well, what they are doing in the, in the, in the book is to, to um, have these very fragmented chapters like very short text, very fragmented chapters. Um, and the speculation in it, I think, is that they don't have to claim any truth. They, truth. they have to provide some thoughts, some, some questions of what sound is and what sound can be. Um, we uh, experienced a, a Jana Sutela's uh, work earlier while you were typing in your, your uh, short bios. Um, so opening up for uh, an understanding of what is uh, Martian language, that was what it tried to do. Um, what does that mean? Like, a, can there be language without a, 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 like a, a rational living being on Mars? Well, that's, that doesn't matter because that was already, already provided in science fiction. Um, so this kind of speculative probe on what is a uh, martial language and then trying to, to, to provide an answer to that through sound, through a musical performance and through a video. Um, that is, uh, I think, a great example of one uh, take on what, what, what this uh, book is, is doing. So, we have ontology or martyrology and um, xenosonics as the, 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 the like kind of in framing uh, uh, words. So much on ontology that is like very much this like uh, going beyond what what uh, Goodman introduced in uh, Sonic Warfare. If some of you read that, like how is 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 sound used um, as a war machine? How is it, um, and 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 not just as a lethal weapon, but maybe something that can be yeah, not as bad as death, but like trying to scare the hell out of you. Um, and also beyond uh, uh, the weaponry of it. I'm sorry, I, I lost it a bit because of the, <laughs> the discussion. I hope it's okay. Maybe someone has some, some comments. Was everything clear in the text? 
So I, I I have a question. Yes. Uh, I'm I'm also very new into the this uh, this theory this field, mm -hmm. but uh, reading I have this question like how how the the unsound would have uh, agency would would uh, as a ghost yeah would have agency as a ghost. It's a very open question. I mean, uh, but I, I, I have this, this, uh, yeah, this question in my mind. How, how, how exactly and how you, you would uh, proper have agency in, in, in the world as a ghost? Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm. Maybe you can you can like uh, elaborate a bit more on on what you mean with the with the ghost. Yeah, that there was when it, it's written the uh, second page. Mm -hmm. it's spoken about the 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 ontology, uh, the ontology's uh, feature. I just have to find it. And, yeah, and that's that's this kind of uh, a relation with a non supernatural concept of the the spectrum. Oh, yeah. Okay, let's just read out that that paragraph then. So, in the early twenty first century, the musical zeitgeist has been infected inflected by the theme of ontology. Uh, a condition res resonating with the impact of general structure malice, uh, a reinvestment in traces of lost futures inhabiting the present, and a non-supernatural -sup concept of the, of the spectra, defined uh, by Fisher as that which uh, acts without physically existing. This ghostly virtual uh, culture of the undead has already spawned a, a Lazarian econ uh, economy based on the digital revivification of dead young African-American musicians as laser lit holograms. Um, here the future, not, uh, not just the past, can be found in the cracks of the present. From Elvis's uh, 2007 holographic uh, appearances uh, on American Idol to Tupac's a chimerical cameo at Coachella, uh, Coachella Festival in 2012. Popular culture has enlisted uh, rotoscoping technology in the reanimation of uh, dead rap uh, and rock stars. Okay, so, th so the term uh, ontology um, is here taken from Mark Fisher, obviously, uh, because he's cited. Um, it derives from uh, Jacques Derrida, um, which has a kind of a, a different take on it. But Mark Fisher takes it from uh, uh, Jacques Derrida and creates his or creates his own uh, uh, understanding of ontology. Um, I think it is in, in his uh, book uh, "The Ghost of My Life" that he is kind of developing, and uh, uh, but it is. Sometimes that I, uh, since I've been working with that. Um, so what is, what is understood here is on, on hauntology. Uh, of course, in, in a, it's, it's a word plate of a, the haunted and ontology, like a combination of that, um, especially in, in Derrida's uh, understanding of it. Um, so how I understand a, a Fisher's take on ontology, that is that, okay, there's a, there's a different kind of temporality. Like the, the past is always haunting us. Uh, it's always present. And then um, this ghost, like let, let's try to understand that as that which is haunting us in the present from, from the past. So uh, Shakur, uh, Tupac Shakur uh, re-emerging as the, the, the ghost or, or, or Elvis or the, like these um, uh, examples that are, are listed here. Um, 
creates a new way of, 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 of a thinking culture. I think that's kind of the point of it, that um, a directedness, a temporality that is not just a going from the present into the future, but also is haunted by the past always, and not a, the, just the present haunted by the past, but the future is haunted by the past, um, if that makes any sense. But I think uh, I just want to add, um, Please. but I think it's also because um, like he's responding to something very specific, which is he has this idea that like after sort of about 2000, sort of at the end of the 90s, he thinks that the sort of lack of cultural progress or musical progress. So basically what he thinks kind of the end of modernism and then like people just recycle old things. So ontology is kind of this idea of of what you said, the, the past haunting the future, but the past being the kind of old, the, the very idea of a future. So uh, this kind of modernist past where people still thought about the future and there was cultural progress. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a, the future that is now the past haunting the future. So it's kind of very complicated. But it's, yeah, basically, it's, I think I think the idea is that when we kind of live in a world where it was just like so much cultural recycling, like reboots, like people doing like 90s music or whatever, like all this old recycling that he's kind of looking for these kind of traces in, in the old that are still pointing to the future. This kind of, which I think is very similar to uh, Ernst Bloch, this idea of sort of the unfulfilled futures, which are still there, but in the past, but we haven't frozen that. So in that sense, we are still kind of uh, new and actual. Yes. Yeah, and I think it's kind of um, making an opposition to uh, what is like a retro thinking, like thinking of, 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 of music uh, having retro, retro fashion, like looking from the present back to uh, let's say uh, 80s music um, like with um, this kind of uh, oh, what's it called this genre um, okay we'll, we'll come in a, in a moment but true that it's a new kind of, of, of a temporal thinking in that way that okay we are not going from the past to the pr uh, present to the future anymore. We are always in the present and that which is the future, that is what we are kind of, kind of trying to run away from. Um, and that is always been haunted by the past. So in that way, the, 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 the modernist thinking is going to the future all the time, like the future will always be better. And now we are haunted by that thinking because there is no future anymore. Like if, if we can be a bit bold and, and say that, um, the future is uh, doomed by our past, what we have done to, to the world and, 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 and so on. Um, and I think there was a shift, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but I think there was a shift um, somewhere around uh, year, year 2000, maybe with World Trade Center. Um, and there was the financial crisis in 2008. And uh, of course we are uh, living now in a climate crisis. Like where, where is the future anymore? Like it's always trying to, uh, in, instead of thinking that, okay, we, we are always getting better and better and better, then we are haunted by whatever has been done always. So it's a new understanding of the future. I'm not sure if that was really clear. Yeah, Burial, there's a comment on that. Sebastian, maybe you can uh, <laughs> elaborate on that. Oh no, it's just someone that Mark Fisher, I guess, I guess takes as somehow paradigmatic of this ontological sonic um, genre of, or, or maybe having some sort of a, um, uh, yeah, interventions from the past that are haunting the present. Uh, 
in a way that is not um, um, yeah in, in a way that is completely constitutive of music it's not just some sort of an addition to it but it's the very core of 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 how this music presents itself mm -hmm. yeah and also Vincent posted a retromania um, from Simon Reynolds which is a very much built on on takes on on a ontology like Mark, Mark Fisher's a ontolo ontology not Derrida's um, which is of course very interesting that is called retro retromania I would say that retro is another kind of of a um, connection to to the past where a uh, ontology in Mark Fisher's uh, uh, sense is um, kind of the opposite in 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 its epistemical uh, uh, thought in relation to sound and to Zemabu's question I think there's a lot uh, also a I want to say more fundamental level, but the idea of phonography also has a lot to do with it, right? Because this idea of ontology has uh, agency without presence or agency without life, right? Mm -hmm. And that's very connected to since the, the invention of phonography and Thomas Edison trying to 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 record the voice of the dead and to to save it for posterity and everything. That is very uh, there's a big part of the, this, this technology, of this mode of culture, right? Of, of recording and, and saving these voices of the dead and these voices of past agencies and how this, this impacts us currently. And I, and I have another, another question about that builds on that from, from this text that is also a basic question that is, is unsound meant to be heard? I think it's something I, I, that stood, stood out to me. And I think that the answer is supposed to be no, but I don't know how clear that is to me. Because I, as I said before, there is, okay, we, have, we can sonify the, the sounds of Jupiter, right? And we can transpose the sounds of, of bats to human auditory range. But is that all that is on sound? Is only this sonifying to be heard or is something more than that? Mm -hmm. and I think something more, but it's obviously less clear when it's not a common experience we have, perceptual experience we have. So that is something I, I was in, very interested in, the Third sex. Question. Is unsound something that needs to be heard? Um, yeah. Like, I think, I think that's kind of part of the thought provocation of, of the, that word. But also, it's very, um, it's very uh, like practical. Like if you look in in, uh, uh, let's see here. Yeah, no, I don't know if it's clear. I'll just have to see if I can look at my camera there. Like this is from um, the Sonic Warfare. You see, like the the auditory spectrum, and then on both sides you have a on sound. It says that in 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 words already there. Um, so, and so in that way, it's kind of addressing that, uh, which is outside of the spectral uh, range of human hearing. Um, but I think that's just the point of departure from that, from, from, from this book, uh, book project. Um, that, okay, that's, that might be sounds of bats and sounds of, 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 uh, of earthquakes um, and all that, but how can we speculate it further? Like that's that's why I, I, I really like that uh, on sound as a speculative probe. Um, so it might have started from Sonic Warfare, uh, that that first page on, in Sonic Warfare, but it's like really like pushing through what what can this uh, concept mean? What can it do? And um, speculative sound of uh, Mart uh, Martian voices or language. It's um, well, you cannot say if it's 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 heard uh, or, or we, that we can hear it in any way, um, but we can speculate about it. And uh, Janusz Tillas' uh, work is trying 
uh, to do that. And that is going beyond uh, that which is unsound to something speculative, um, which can produce many other thoughts. And that's, that's, I think, is the beauty of the book, that it's not clear, it's, it's not proved by anything, but it's like really trying to push through what, what, can, what can sound do as well. Um, and not trying to argue against, like, of course, there are many different texts in the book, but it's not trying to specifically create a system of this is on sound and we have all of these realms that is building the building blocks and, and it's consistent. It's not consistent. It's fragmented. It's, it, it can be anything. And that's what, what, what the quality of it um, is, I think. And therefore, also I asked about what, how, how is that uh, that uh, introduction structured? Like it's clearly also an artistic project, um, and that leads us to the question: what can what can art do? Like it can, uh, instead of uh, having to uh, argue through a, a critique of uh, vibrational ontologies and so on, art can do something else. Art has to be um, it can be uh, dubious. It, has, it doesn't have to be clear, and m many of the texts are not that clear. That maybe telling a short story or, um, or, or or just elaborating on on, a, on an idea, and 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 that's the cool thing about it. Like it's it's really trying to open up uh, sonic thinking as. Not, not, not in the way I think uh, uh, Jonathan Stern meant it in, in, in his text, um, but going beyond that. Um, how, how, is, how can we push the limits of what sound can do and what sonic thought can do? Um, I'm just curious, because in, in this introduction, though, it, it seems quite often like um, and I haven't, I haven't read the book, so I think, you know, qualified the claim of that, but mm -hmm. it seems like there's like a, an underlying hermeneutics of this kind of speculation at the same time, which then sort of like reinscribes the representational form onto this kind of speculative claim about what sound can do. And mm -hmm. in this sense, I'm curious as to whether it is really thinking through sound or whether it's, you know, um, like giving an interpretation to, to kind of sound in a in a sort of like representational way um in which case you know uh we we end up with kind of the same problem that we had previously with even with the new materialist stuff where there's like a lot of implicit sort of biases or whatever that come into the kind of subjective determinations and you know like maybe that's fine you know i, I don't see that as necessarily being a problem but then uh, mm -hmm. the question becomes like how do we negotiate between those what sort of which, which then almost like implies a kind of systematicity or a need for something like more like uh like tractable or something i don't know um but yeah i just like i was thinking because you because of the stuff with mark fisher and, and this the sort of like ontology and stuff like the way in which this sort of Im implies a phase locked kind of um like it, it is making an ontological claim and it also makes a claim around like the kind of phase lock trajectory that we're on um based on a kind of uh, like uh, like the kind of ramifying consequences of like prior events and decisions. Um, I'm wondering whether that ontology itself is kind of constructed by, um, you know, like like a kind of an assumed form of power or lack of power to be able to like overcome the existing kind of uh, challenges in in the sense of like you know like Mark uh, Fisher and like people like Friedrich Jameson who is quite influenced by always harken back to this kind of like revival of popular modernism, well, maybe is this structure of thinking as a way of overcoming that kind of like problem that they've identified um, in terms of like, you know, the, the sort of ontological kind of thesis or whatever, is this not in a sense kind of like a, a conceded form of, of like subjective, um, you know, is, is this not the thing that needs to be overcome in a sense is, is sort of like the question. Um, and then I think it like goes into media, questions around media, like, you know, how do we, how do these sounds become distributed and like uh, how do we yeah um, I don't know like there's there's a lot of things I guess but yeah um, yeah there's a lot of things there yeah um, well 
Well, I don't think that they necessarily want to, like, of course, it's, it's, it is a collection of texts. So there's n no one direction they're all trying to go. Um, so I think that, that the hermeneutic uh, interpretation of some, in some of the texts is very valid. And some of them are trying to avoid that in the same time. Um, so, so it's, yeah, in that way, it's not, it, it's, it's a, it's a book written by several authors, like many authors. Um, and that way it's, it's, it's trying to do a lot of different things. Um, so it's, yeah, I don't know if, it, if, if that answers your question, but it's like when I'm reading it, I, I, I read very fragmented and as an artwork more than a theory book. Um, and well, I also come from the art university and there we understand partly uh, art as theory. So a way of thinking, a way of, of, of uh, gaining new knowledge, which is opposed to, to systematic uh, philosophical thinking that what uh, James might call philosophy with a capital F, uh, F with a capital P, sorry. <laughs> um, and um, personally, I think that's, the, that's a really good way to, to, to approach philosophy and, and do new thinking. Um, but that's also just my world. <laughs> Also, uh, sorry, can I take the... Please. Thanks. Uh, I don't know if I can totally answer to Enda, but I think I can contribute to some point to what uh, you were asking about. Uh, I think there is this kind of uh, discipline which is called media archaeology, uh, which is... Uh, they, they have... Uh, done a lot of uh, references towards that kind of revival of media and nostalgia towards uh, a certain media uh, devices or way of uh, thinking about media but they insist on um, they insist on uh, this uh, of they insist on their contribution uh, in understanding this kind of uh, ontology, uh, uh, like understanding this past presence uh, going on in this uh, uh, time, which is not linear uh, in the way media, but also we can say sound or the sonic event evolves. So uh, they insist on that, uh, they suggest better, they suggest this nonlinear way of uh, uh, considering uh, media evolution or media presence and i can relate it to, to the ontology uh, conception to the way uh, it produces this uh, entanglement of temporalities and in that way i think it can be con uh, uh, this uh, ontology conception has a constructive capacity towards arts and also towards the way we make history or on and other other ontologies maybe so I don't know if I can answer to this uh, subjectiveness thing, but maybe uh, this uh, all, all these kind of revivalisms and ontologies that go on uh, in, to the unsound, but also to to the media uh, spectrum. Maybe uh, all, all of the some of these issues have been addressed from uh, media archaeologists. It's I think it's a very nice way of. Uh, uh, making interpretations of uh, uh, ontology, a way, a, a way of making interpretations towards that direction. I don't know if that helped. Yeah, very much. Um, like we are, we are slowly approaching the end of today's session. Um, I would really like to um, hear some of you who are, have not been saying so much um, for the last like five, seven minutes. Um, like of course we can, it can be related to uh, what Chara said, but also uh, other comments on, on what we've been uh, going through today.
well. <laughs> it's also okay not to speak. I will not force anyone. Um, okay, so any any from from all of you, any um, final comments on on today's session? Like, if there anything that is unclear, or, or we we could discuss a bit, um, I'm I'm very open for that. Um, otherwise, we'll talk about the sessions that are coming. Um, maybe I, I, I thought I'd give someone, I've spoken a lot, so I was a bit reluctant to speak up again. But anyway, like, um, maybe think, I was just thinking in like an audio metaphorical terms of um, this idea of like, like um, hauntology and how um, like this nostalgia functions as like a recursive signal um, and maybe like I was I just keep thinking of like audio as like a, a really like effective metaphor for it because like I mean like it's almost like there's an echo that keeps like like losing strength but like keeps recurring back and when you think about like fashion or culture or things that happen in cycles there's like you know like what they say like maybe like a 30-year cycle like um, so like you know, the 90s, like a lot of the tropes of the 60s were back into fashion and, and so forth. And then like what we're seeing is like this kind of like echo, but that's slowly like kind of losing, losing like, um, uh, losing like strength. So it's like, um, like if we view recursion in this like nostalgic kind of pattern, it's like, you, I think the audio metaphor maps onto it quite, I don't know if that sounds like a really like obvious thing to say, but anyway. <laughs> Well, um, maybe for to some it might be obvious, but like that is also part of what we can understand as a, a sonic metaphors or sonic thinking. Um, maybe that wouldn't be that clear if we were not using sonic uh, metaphors in a way. Not saying that they are better or worse than any other words or, or concepts, but I think that's one of the the the. the one of the key uh, arguments as well from, from Jonathan Stern that this kind of vocabulary um, is useful um, to think sonically like that, like it's echoing, it's uh, reverbering, uh, that is uh, resonating. Um, I think that's a very valid, valid point um, to, to, to uh, think uh, like that. And then I think it's also a good way to uh, engage with a uh, sound studies uh, text that's trying to uh, not just read the words of of of, of um, uh, resonating, for example, uh, as as a concept that is just the the word as we uh, understand it in our everyday life, but trying to really engage with what what does it mean that something is resonating or something is uh, rhythmical. Um, I know uh, we, we talked a bit about uh, Deleuze uh, Gattori, and they 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 did that. Um, they 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 took the the the, the rhythmical uh, event or rhythmicity <laughs> and and developed into concept of thought, um, and a what what is rhythmical. Like if you read a uh, thousand plateaus uh, in on on the refrain, um, they they are developing what what is what is this recurring sound? Is that a uh, rhythmical? Um, and is is the marching band the most rhythmical thing you could uh, imagine? And they say no, it's the op op opposite. Uh, the marching band is the the the, the least rhythmical. And now I'll not get, go into details with that, but that's another way of thinking what is written, a, 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 another way of, of understanding something through sound, some, something through a musical event. Um, so, yeah, we, we can uh, individually talk about uh, that, that book um, later on if, if you want to, I would love to do that. Um, now we have kind of come to the end um, of the session. I'll just check the, the, um, the presentations. So next week, one subscribed Aladdin uh, as a presenter and Enda as a responder. Um, maybe you all would go back to, to the 
the document. I see there are also some that are very crowded, um, especially Steve Goodman, Lawrence uh, Abel Hamdan. I don't know if, if, if one or two would would uh, uh, jump to uh, uh, one of the less crowded um, seminars. I would say that um, I will let that be open um, until, yeah, let, I will just let it be open uh, until uh, uh, tonight, or yeah, for me tonight is, uh, yeah, it's now. But yeah, uh, tomorrow morning, my time, Berlin, um, which is in, I don't know, 12 hours. Um, I will uh, uh, close it down then. And, and then I hope that it kind of sorted out and then we could just go with that. Um, I hope that this has been uh, interesting, the, the introduction part, and uh, that you have uh, gotten something from it. And I hope that you are looking forward to the next sessions, if you have um, any final questions regarding the whole seminar or any comments uh, on today, then please let me know now. Um, yeah. I just had one for the presentations. Are you going to send out more text for us to present on um, for next time? Is Or are they already up somewhere? I just received the text from uh, Leslie during our session, I saw. So okay. we'll in a minute. Great. Then, um, oh, that's a question from Sharon. I signed up for this course quite late in the day and wasn't sent any of the readings. Um, who should I check with to make sure it uh, happened for next week? I think there is a Google Drive folder, is that right? Um, with, the, with the readings. Um, and you'll also get a, a, an e email for, for every seminar. So um, I'll be I'll make sure that everyone has all the readings also from from today. Um, yeah. Good. All right. Then um, thank you for joining in, and I'm looking very much to uh, the coming sessions, and we see each other on Sunday.